I must uh, explain uh, why it is for me so important to present this uh, content. Uh, for 30 years, I am uh, how unprofessionally, let us say, but uh, I am studying uh, uh, ancient uh, Lithuanian language and uh, links between Lithuanian and other Baltic languages with other um, uh, ancient languages. And uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, uh, truism, let us say, that there are big uh, affinities between uh, uh, Lithuanian, other Baltic languages and Old Indian uh, language. So uh, my presentation today will be more uh, through the lens, how to say, of uh, language, but also as far as language reflects uh, cultural things, there will be also some affinities linked with uh, um, history, with uh, religious, religion, uh, and other cultural things. So, um, uh, all sources which I will present, all, all data which I will present here are picked from uh, legal, how to say, uh, acknowledged uh, sources uh, from uh, vocabularies, uh, etymological vocabularies, uh, um, Russian, uh, Sanskrit, Lithuanian vocabularies, and also uh, such um, etymological vocabularies as Mayhofer, Uhlenbeck, and so on. It's a bit that there are no uh, there is no uh, Lithuanian and uh, Sanskrit vocabulary yet. So uh, it, uh, it is not so easy to pick all that information. So probably it will be interesting. If you want to understand affinities, affinities between Baltic and uh, Sanskrit in one glance, you should look at this, uh, this slide. Uh, this slide shows that you can uh, construct a sentence when every, every uh, word is uh, uh, almost the same in Lithuanian and in Sanskrit. The, it is a saying, Dievas doda dentis, Dievas dos donos. It is a saying, it's a proverb uh, which was documented in uh, Lithuanian uh, in language from 18th century. In Sanskrit, it is uh, constructed, but it is constructed in, uh, how to say, in uh, books of uh, philologists, linguists, uh, to show the big affinity between these two languages. So there is no other language in the world which uh, can be done in such a way that uh, you see, for example, Danas, Blonos uh, bread, the, you have other words in other languages, and so on. So, um, uh, the only one scholar uh, who wrote a book about uh, Bolts and Aryans, or uh, Old Indians, uh, about affinities between these two cultures, uh, is an uh, Indian scholar. Suniti Kumar Chatterjee. Uh, it's a pity there is no other, uh, how to say, uh, literature which is uh, assigned to, uh, which would be assigned to this uh, um, aspect, to, to, to Baltic Aryan uh, cultural uh, affinities. Uh, Uh, let us say some words, uh, some, some things from uh, uh, linguistic, uh, how to say, um, linguistic, uh, <laughs> okay, as linguists uh, say about these affinities, <laughs> okay. So, uh, you see, uh, uh, Jan Puel in the Europeist said 
that Lithuanian has a quiet reputation as a repository of archaic curiosities which find matches most often in Old Indian. So, uh, why are these affinities appear in uh, Vedic, uh, in Old Indian Sanskrit language and in uh, very remote Baltic languages. Uh, for example, uh, um, Chatterjee explained that it is because of uh, common Indo-European origin, but you will see later that it is not in us because uh, these curiosities, these matches are uh, <laughs> too marvelous uh, it is not possible to explain only uh, because of common origin. So there, there is an attempt to say that because Indians are isolated in, you know, uh, Indian subcontinent or Baltic people, we are also isolated in uh, Eastern European uh, forests because of this isolation. Uh, another explanation, the conservativeness that both societies we are very uh, conservative uh, because of big impact of priestly classes and because of very developed uh, law, uh, verbal law culture. But uh, there is another explanation that uh, these matches which will be presented here uh, are because of lasting neighborhood after the split of so-called common in the European uh, homeland. So, uh, for example, there are only several languages in uh, in the European languages with, which uh, underwent uh, phonetical transformation, which is called certainization, when uh, certain for example, uh, uh, stops as K became to She or Se. So it's only in Indian, Iranian, and also Balto-Slavic languages. So it means that they should have been in neighborhood uh, because uh, the other peripheric uh, Indo-European languages uh, remained Kentum. The, for example, Kentum, Centum, it means 100. And in Lithuania, it's Shintas. In, in, in Indian, uh, in Sanskrit, it's Satem. So it's not K, but S, Ash. So, um, what about this um, supposed uh, Proto Indo European homeland? Uh, it's mainstream science says that uh, this homeland was in uh, uh, North Pontic Black Sea. Uh, and, and North Caspian region, steppes of uh, southern Ukraine and and and, uh, and southern Russia, uh, present day Russia and Ukraine. So this culture was called Yamna, or to translate Pitcom culture. And uh, uh, archaeologists say that it was about three thousand five hundred years before Common Era. It is now mainstream uh, uh, hypothesis or theory because it is also it is approved not only uh, by archaeological data, which the spread of archaeological uh, cultures to Europe, to Middle Europe, but also genetic data. Uh, so uh, there is a rather recent publication by Huck who says, uh, which, is, which proved that uh, almost um, or even more than half of population in Central Europe uh, uh, was uh, replaced genetically by these people from uh, Southern uh, Ukraine. Uh, this this uh, theory um, was created by American Lithuanian archaeologist Maria Berute Gimbutene. Uh, I, I, I won't say again one thing about this uh, map. 
you see proto bulbs here uh, and also you see uh, the hypothetical place of Aryans or old Indians, Indo-Aryans. And on the north, you see a proto finno ugrians which are non-Indo-European uh, people. Uh, do not forget all this, how to say, uh, map. Uh, so, um, about uh, Maria Berute Gimbutene, in uh, American it is uh, rendered as Maria Gimbutas. Uh, um, uh, she was a main, uh, not only proponent, but um, uh, she grounded this uh, theory of, of uh, Indo-European homeland in, uh, in uh, North Pontic area, North Caspian area. So probably Maria Gimbutene is one of most influential Lithuanian scientists uh, in modern uh, world. It was a big uh, uh, <laughs> for me. It, it was a very, very impressive thing to uh, because I um, managed to participate in her lectures uh, in the nineties. So there are other um, theories. One of of it is that uh, about this ancient uh, about ancient farmers. Uh, spreading or, dif or diffusing from uh, homeland in Anatolia. Uh, it, it is a uh, less approved theory because now it is not supported by uh, genetic data and it is very complicated to explain uh, uh, Indo-Europeanization of Northern Europe, according to this theory. So another theory about homeland in Central Europe, uh, it was only before Second World War, but it was fashionable. Uh, now it is accepted as a secondary center, uh, as a second homeland after the Europeans spread from uh, Southern uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I, I am I'm trying to be very short. And Paleolithic continuity hypothesis says that uh, there were no, the, 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 all people lived uh, in Europe from uh, Paleolithic, from Ice Age. And, there, there's, and even, even they say, some, some of them say that there is no such thing as homeland. Uh, and uh, finally, out of India uh, theory or Northern India hypothesis that uh, Indo-Europeans uh, came from Northern India, it's uh, not supported, dismissed by main, mainstream science. Uh, but uh, I would say that it is it probably could be compatible with uh, Gimbutas theory because. Uh, uh, um, the proponents of this theory say that uh, southern Ukraine and southern Russia was a secondary, second homeland. Uh, one thing, another thing that st steppe region between North India and uh, South Russia uh, was easily, uh, how to say, covered, it was like a bridge uh, which uh, for nomadic people, very mobile people, uh, it was easy to uh, um, overcome. So they were going to north and to south for many thousands of years. So uh, it, it, we should not um, uh, think so very, very primitively that a particular people uh, from uh, point A to point B in particular time migrated and it's, this was a history. No, history was more complicated. So the reason why I want to present uh, the neighborhood, neighborhood concept, neighborhood of Bal Baltic, ancient Baltic people and uh, Indian, uh, old Indian Vedic people is because of this book, uh, a book of Oleg Nikolaevich Trubachev, 
who is a was a prominent uh, um, uh, philologist uh, and who wrote a book about uh, Indo-Aryans in uh, South Ukraine up to uh, early medieval times. There are about 300 toponyms in North Pontic area which can be explained only from uh, Indo-Aryan languages. Not from Iranian, but from Indo-Aryan languages. There are traces of languages which, language which is similar to Prakrit, and there are, mm, there are uh, historical data which show traces of uh, Shaivism and even Shastras. Uh, for example, uh, the, it is an inscription in stone in Crimea about uh, Shastras. Uh, so it's of course uh, a, a marker of Indo-Aryan, even even post-Vedic uh, people. So uh, it occurs that not simply Indo-Aryans lived in uh, uh, South Ukraine, but they communicated with North India. And uh, one of uh, proofs that uh, Indo-Aryans were in South Ukraine and South uh, Russia, uh, for example, is a god Swarog in Slavic, uh, in Old Slavic, in, in Kievan, Kievan Rus uh, pantheon of gods. So the only explanation about Swarog is that it comes from Sanskrit Svarga, heaven, and meaning the same. So it means that Indo-Aryans participated in ethnogenesis of uh, Slavs in migration period. It means in the fourth century of common era. Uh, I picked some examples. The not only you know, toponymic or linguistic uh, uh, proofs says about such a uh, Indo-Aryan na neighborhood uh, to forested area of uh, Eastern Europe. But also, you see, names, Sindoi, Sindu, and also rendered in uh, uh, Herodot text that this is Indoi people. So they were living near Tanais, near Don River, which was also called, another name of Don River was Sinu. And there were other places which are, we are called Syndica in uh, southern Ukraine. Uh, I will not repeat uh, what is written in, in slides, but, but it's important to understand that the river names such as Kuban, Badrak, can be explained only from Indo-Aryan and especially Manohotra <laughs> river, which is... Can, it's uh, really very recent uh, uh, proof of, of presence of Indo-Aryans in uh, southern Ukraine. Look, also name of kings, Taksaka, Palaka, even name of the city, Palakion, now Balaklava. It's because of Palaka, defender, prince in Sanskrit language. There is no such word in, in, in Iranian language. Also such word as Butanatos, which means uh, Butanata, the ruler of spirits, God Shiva. Also there are inscription, inscriptions with uh, word Mahadeva, for example. Uh, interesting thing that there was a continuity between uh, Slavic people which come to this uh, uh, region and uh, uh, predecessors which were Indo-Aryan. For example, named Chile, uh, in Russian, the same place is called Orlov. Orol in Russian is eagle. What mean, the meaning of Sanskrit? Chile, the bird from the family of eagles. Uh, not to mention about uh, toponym Raman, uh, which is also has cognates in Baltic languages. You know, the Romova, uh, Romove, Ramos. Romova is uh, uh, also in other Baltic languages. 
So why these uh, discoveries of uh, Nikolai Trubachev are kept in silence for already 20 years? Um, one of the reasons that it, not, it is not easy to criticize such a, a professional, a prominent uh, um, scholar is very authoritative scholar. There are other um, scholars who, who uh, have, have tried to ground the uh, presence of Indo-Aryans in South Ukraine, for example, famous scholar Kretschmer at the beginning of uh, last century. But uh, Trubachev made in systematic way. So the, the main, the main uh, uh, reason why uh, it is kept in silence because it is in contradiction with mainstream thesis about Iranians in this region. This region is usually attributed to Iranian culture uh, and uh, uh, when, when it is an attempt to discuss, is it true that uh, at very early time uh, Iranians uh, uh, appeared in, 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 in this steppe region, then it comes, it is a problem because the earliest data show not Iranians but Indo-Aryans in this region. For example, borrowings in Finno-Ugrian languages, for example, facts about Slavic ethnogenesis, which was also, I said about uh, the Indo-Aryan presence, and also Baltic Indic affinities. Affinities not between Baltic and Iranian, but affinities between Indo-Iranian and Baltic. And um, Biggest, um, how to say, it's my, my uh, di diagnosis that uh, because uh, of inherited, inherited uh, stereotype that uh, re uh, Central Asia is uh, uh, Persian, is, is Iranian culture, Iranian civilization, but it, it occurred uh, only after Islam expansion in eight 10 centuries before that, there are, there are no traces of uh, prevailing Iranian component in this region. On opposite, there are many, many facts about Indo-Aryan presence prevailing in Central Asia. And it's a pity to say that one of the most uh, reasons why there is a silence because there is ignorance and no serious interest in Indian academic society to research, to investigate the relative cultures in Central Asia and the West Eurasian steppes. Uh, let us say about uh, Bo uh, loan words from uh, Indo-Aryan languages to uh, uh, <laughs> Finno-Ugrian languages, which are, as you have seen, in northern area of Eastern Europe. So it's Aria from Aryan. Aryan can be also uh, Iranic name. But when you see Asera, Lord, Lord Primra, not from Iranian, but from Indo-Aryan. Also other borrowings such as Sapta, not Hapta, but Sapta, like in Lithuanian language as well, which means seven, or Shashve, Sasa, as in Sanskrit Sasa, not Sanha, as in, in Iranian, it, uh, it means here. And also, for example, Meksha, it's from old Indian Maksha, bee fly, and so on. The, all these facts are picked out from Russian and uh, Finno, uh, Finnic and uh, 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 academical literature. Let's return, you know, where Lithuania is, Latvia, the two uh, 
nations from Baltic uh, stock. Uh, Estonia is also a Baltic state, but it's another language. It's Finno-Ugrian language. Uh, and the, uh, still Finno-Ugrian languages are in Northern Russia up to, uh, up to Ural region. So, but it's a modern time. If we look at our history, and now I will shock you, uh, probably you, some of you are acquainted with history, it will not a big shock, but uh, in medieval time, Lithuania, so uh, Lithuania was the largest state in medieval time um, in territory in Europe. It was almost one third of present-day Indian territory. Uh, and uh, look, you see that uh, Moscow Duchy was a principality which uh, was uh, governed by Tatars. You see Novgorod region, which was under protection of Lithuania in medieval time against Moscow expansion. Uh, you see the Poland uh, state, which is, let us say, six times less in medieval time in territory as, as Lithuania. And you uh, may understand that territory of this empire, which was not relatively, relatively recently, uh, covers all Belarus and all almost uh, a major part of Ukrainian territory. So uh, this state uh, is responsible for ethnogenesis of uh, Belarusian and Ukrainian people. And uh, Russia, don't make mistake, such uh, Russia, Russian Empire is a product of late 18th century. In our tradition, we, we call them Moscovitans uh, because the true uh, Russians were living, you know, in from early medieval time in Kievan Rus, which is now the Ukraine. Names of Baltic people. So, Esti, it was from in Roman time, uh, um, they were trading amber with Roman Empire. Uh, also medieval time, there was a name Goethe, but uh, it's not so easy to, uh, uh, to distinguish between other people uh, Tratian, of Tratian Dacian stock, which were also called Goethe and which were living in, you know, uh, Northern Balkans and, and Balts. Balts is a, uh, not a historical name. It was proposed by German scholar Nesselmann only in 19th century because uh, it was not easy. If, if, if you call Lithuanians, then you uh, do not <laughs> Uh, contain Latins and so on. So historically, because these people were living near Baltic Sea, the Nestleman proposed to call them Baals. By the, uh, I should add also that the name of Baltic River of Baltic of the Baltic Sea is uh, probably from uh, Baltic uh, or origin of Baltic language. Uh, to uh, present uh, linguistic things, but you can uh, look at uh, root iced, Istians, iced, and uh, what this root means in Baltic languages and what does it mean in Sanskrit languages. And you will see that the meanings are very, very uh, similar. And uh, it comes to, to common etymology, which can be explained, right ones, favorite ones, respectful ones, 
dear ones. So it's interesting that such a uh, what is Ishta Deva or money or Ishta friend favorable favor, favorable uh, respectable as in Latvian East Eastern and they they came from the same um, etymon. Also, there are cognates in other languages in uh, Slavic. Interesting in Latin, estu to light up, estimo, estimate, you know, value. Also in Greek, goddess estia, hers, virgin goddess of hers. And it uh, reminds us uh, about all the Lithuanian tradition of home hers and eternal fires for communities which are looked over by virgin girls, which are called Vaidilutes. You know, Vaidila is the name of priest in Lithuanian language, which is, which is cognate to uh, the word Vedic, Vedi, which is a hers, you know, in Sanskrit. And so we have a common paradigm of fire worship in all classic nations, we would say, <laughs> Latin, uh, Greek, uh, Old Indian, and Baltic. Now, uh, when you have seen um, about uh, Latvian Lithuania, which now in modern time live uh, small countries living in the eastern uh, four of the Baltic Sea, uh, you should uh, not make a mistake because it was just 35 years ago when it was and it is now established fact that all Baltic people were living in all forested Europe, Eastern Europe, from Denmark up to Volga region. Why it is established fact? Because the rivers of this region up to Moscow, for example, uh, upper Oka region uh, in East are can be explained only, only from Baltic languages. There are hundreds of hydronyms and so-called all Baltic uh, hydronyms area, which means that uh, it was from it was uh, inhabited by Baltic people from early Bronze time up to migration period, and uh, you see. The, in the southeastern uh, part of the map, you see the, the territory of steppes. So it's like, like now we understand that it was neighborhood, neighborhood, ancient neighborhood between Baltic and Indo-Aryan people. And um, uh, you should understand that there were no Slavs in forests in Eastern Europe before migration period. It's also established fact that only from 6th, 7th century of common era, they began to penetrate the forested territory of Eastern Europe. But Iceland's of Baltic people remained up to uh, 11, 12th uh, century of common era, the Slavic uh, dukes were fighting against Baltic people near Moscow in 12th century. So, uh, not to mention Belarus, where we have uh, Baltic uh, speaking islands up to 20, uh, beginning of 20th century. Um, now I want to <laughs> show the, these affinities about uh, between neighbors. So uh, some of these things are well known as, um, you, because Dievas, Dios is also common for, for other Indo European languages in Latin. Those in Greek, uh, 
uh, in you know in Iranian diva it means demon, not god. Um, um, but Varuna and Velinus, it's already a particular match. And also Perkunas, which is uh, like Indra in Lithuanian mythology, in Sanskrit, Parajania, Indra, uh, Epo, uh, it's uh, like, uh, like uh, another name for I Indra. Uh, now we get to uh, more uh, astonishing uh, matches at Dawn, Goddess of Dawn, in Lithuanian Oshrine, in Sanskrit Ushas. But in dialects, you have a word, for example, in Lithuanian Ushra and Ushar in, in Sanskrit. There are, there are such uh, words in dialects in which are almost. 100% the same. And Ugnis, Agnis is a fire god. In Lithuanian language, it's a feminine, but uh, there are some dialects which are also masculine. The particular match is about Ashveni, Ashvini, Nasatias, uh, you know, Ashva in both languages means horse. God of the wind, Vayas in Sanskrit, Vayu, but <laughs> when you look at Vayopati, Svayupati, then you have almost 100% match, which is only in these two languages. What is rivers, Upes in Prussian, all Prussian language, which is, which is the, was the best in Baltic language before Germanization, you know, this is an extinct language, Old Prussian, it was uh, ex extinct in the late 18th century. And the name of Prussians uh, was imposed to Eastern Germans in the Old Prussian Empire. So they are not true Prussians, Old Prussians were the uh, native dwellers of uh, southern uh, shores of Baltics. So, concepts in Lithuanian Derme, Darna is like Darna, Dharma. Uh, in Sanskrit Tilta and Lithuanian Tiltas, you know, it's like uh, bridge, like uh, uh, ferry, like uh, pass to another side. Uh, in Lithuanian ascetic man, Elgeta, it's a more um, as a meaning with beggar, but uh, you know, um, L goes for, for R in Sanskrit. So it's almost the same word as Arhata, Arhata in Sanskrit. Uh, interesting match is Dhyana in Avestian Daina. In uh, the song in Lithuanian, Daina, Daina, Daina in Latvian, Daina in Lithuanian. You know, Lithuanians is a small country, but uh, we have 500,000 variants of um, ancient songs which are in our archives now. Uh, we have probably the the largest vocabulary in the world. It's about it's it's twenty volumes and about one million words. So uh, we have a literacy a literature, let us say, only from sixteenth century, but it does not mean that we our culture was like culture of savages as Christian uh propagandists sometimes say and lithuania was a uh, last pagan or heathen empire so lithuanian was uh, the elite of lithuanians was christianized only in the 15th century and we were fighting for more than 200, almost 250 years against crusaders from all Europe. 
uh, our religion uh, what is about religion uh, of course are uh, from pre-christian times so it still survived until recent time on uh, religion fem but also feminists like in sanskrit rules like uh, other words of the same uh, etymon i mentioned already ramus romus romova sanctuary which is like the the same meaning quite serene not not so joyful as in indo-aryan culture in, in indo-aryan culture sanskrit also means joyful quietness and uh, last uh, not not last about religion but maybe most most surprising thing you know the uh, lithuanian culture we had the highest priest uh, of his religion it, uh, from medieval times it was a common high priest for all Baltic uh, nations. And uh, it is historically documented that uh, one priestly class comes from the family of Astikas. So you should remember that Astika in Sanskrit means what? Means followers of Vedas. And to show the, it's not so easy to show um, the deepness of affinity not only with Lithuanian language but also with La uh, Latvian language for example the expression in Sanskrit agra karas which means the first ray of rising sun in Latvian it's almost the same agras kars it means uh, it it uh, it's a document about religion which uh, uh, in which sun surya or in Fenian saule was a very important start of the day and very important god and you know uh, the sanskrit word the word rita we would say rita uh, and Rita's morning. The, the, I have, I have the. Uh, they have similar meaning. Uh, okay. Um, when we speak about affinities between Baltic and uh, Lithuanian languages and cultures there is one conception that is because the archaities archaic things were retained in these two cultures yes and uh, um, if you if you want to prove archaity and uh, original uh, common origin of languages languages you should look to for example to pronouns uh, of these languages uh, as in other European languages, Indo-European languages, the main pronouns are similar, but when you look to other pronouns, then you see the almost 100% match between uh, languages. So especially surprising uh, such words as kas, kas, Katras, katras, kada, kada, tada, tada, with whom, ku, in Lithuanian, ko. You see, this is only a part of uh, pronouns, but it's almost, almost uh, uh, every word, every pronoun in these languages is almost 100% match. So no other language, not even not even Iranian, not even Slavic languages are such close. Let us look on numerals. 
there is difference about uh, word one uh, in the Sanskrit do we have ekam but in all Lithuanian there was in Prussian there was also what ukas and we have also a similar meaning of uh, in Sanskrit anos so this is not a difference all other words except except for nine because in Sanskrit we have n for Lithuanian de it's a minor difference but when we look at the grammar of uh, numerals we see the hundred percent match uh, the third trachas three all three triatas uh, uh, all three trita in sanskrit trai tertias and even the in three you would say in sanskrit trishu in old Lithuanian trisu. Uh, not only simply numerals, but also, for example, multiplying uh, Sangunaya. They, you, you see the stop N, which probably because in all times there was another stop here. And when we look to Baltic languages, we see that there is stop should should have been b and dvigubinti keturgubinti trigubinti dvigubinti dvigunayati it means uh, to multiply twice and so on kinship you see that uh, old words for kinship almost 100 percent the same even bright, yauna vede, yauva ved vadu, the same, the same word roots, the same concepts. Uh, such words as, for example, napat, in the Finnian is used for grandson, or in, you have son or daughter, the same in other languages, but, but not about uh, the brother of your wife which is Dever in, 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 in Sanskrit and Dever is in Lithuania and so on. So I have not enough time to present everything. If we look at uh, flora and fauna, we see that Virkas in Sanskrit and Vilkas and other in the European words are not so close, but and Babras and Bebras, but they, they are, they are uh, close. Not so close, but close. But when we look at Fox, and you have Lape or Lapsha, Lapsha in Latvian, in Sanskrit, Lopasha, we should, we should await here not L, but R, because of rhoticism in Sanskrit languages. But we have <laughs> differently, as, as in Iranian language, which have this R. We have Lopasha, it's like, like more similar to, to the Baltic word. Urvam, Urvas, cave. Kirmis, Kirmis, Swam, Blusa, Blushi, Flea, Shuffle, Shapras, a certain fish, and so on. If you look at everyday words of everyday life, Vish, Veshas, Veshe, community, the bed in Latvian, Telpa, in Sanskrit, Talpa, the bedding, Patalam, Patalas in Lithuanian, also other words. Uh, part of chain, grandi, grandis, pravagas, pravagas, transport. We have also words for metallurgy. Even vajra, it comes from vadati and has a cognate word, vedega, ax, or in, in Latin, vedga. Some words are 100% match. For example, lok, raktas, rakta, raktas, k in Lithuanian, valga, valgs, is uh, like. Uh, rope, <laughs> but even vamsas, a pipe, vamsdis. You have no such words in other languages, even in Iranian or Slavic. The instruments, uh, dambaras, a dambaras, tromel, no, dambrealis. Uh, but most impressive is kakali, kankali, it's kankles. It's like Lithuanian arf. Uh, simply to look 
it's not, to understand that it, I did not pick uh, some words, but you can you can see the affinity between two languages. For example, a human body, not only about skull, not only about hair, not only about um, ear, eyes, which is also in other languages, but ashra, tear, is a match between these two languages only. Gnosis, Nasa, it's in other languages, but Jandas, Ganda, it's for uh, um, <laughs> not for chin, okay, but for, for, for face, yes, and, and so on. Jambas, Jambas, it's uh, also uh, two smakras, smashru, it's a chin, rastas, jastas, it's a for, for uh, hand, uh, and so on. Shlonis, a part of leg, shroni, you know, like uh, uh, also janga is a leg, vanga, jeng, it's to go, Lithuanian, and so on. Also, we have names, uh, words from, um, no, drapana, close drapana, the same word, uh, or helmet, shalmas, sharmas in, 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 in Sanskrit. Or, or without clothes, nogas, nagnan in Prussian, nagna, naked. It's also in Slavic, uh, and so on. Uh, also, philosophy, asmo, asma, person, Maniti, nomane, manate, anumana, think, decide, and so on. Many, many words which can be rendered not only because of phonetic affinity, but also of meanings. Colors. Balta, balas, melna, black, melina in Sanskrit, malina, kirsnas, black in, in Prussian, Krishna, you know, shemas, it's about, about horses, black, shamiya in Sanskrit, shivas, shivya, also about horses, uh, not to mention rauda, raudona, ruda, it's also another language, means brown, but beras, bara, also brown for horses, and so on. Other basic words for Surya, for Moon, for Day, Diana, Dina, for, for Night, it's also in other languages. Tamsa, Tamas, it's, it's, uh, again, we have match for darkness. Uh, jiva, Givas, Mirtis, Des, Mirtis. Dumas, Dumas, the smoke, and so on. So thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you for your lecture. Um, I, I just uh, heard you say, maybe I was mistaken, but I heard you say that Central Asia was uh, Iranian only in the Islamic period. No, but, uh, you, you, you did not understand me properly. Maybe I was not very precise. So uh -huh. I spoke about Iranians in Central Asia uh -huh. uh, only from Islamic period. But in Southern Central Asia, the Zoroastrian people from Iran have come rather er early. Uh, oh, yes. But it does not change the fact that the prevailing culture in all steppe region from North India up to Southern Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. was Indo-Aryan before Iranians came. Yes. Okay. So thanks for the clarification. The other question is that uh, in uh, Western Europe, at least, you have non-Indo-European substrates for toponyms. Do you have that phenomenon in the Baltic region? Very good question. <laughs> Very good question. 
is a it is a weak point of Maria Gimbuta's theory because we have no such traces of uh, substrat people in old Baltic area. Uh, you know, our northern and northeastern neighbors, we are uh, Finno-Ugrian people, and we intermixed with them. And they came from north, let us say, 4,000 years before Common Era to this region. But in southern forested region, in, in native region of Baltic uh, people, there is no sign of any substrate before Ice Age. Mm -hmm. You know that Ice Age finished 8,000 8, years before Common Era. So the another theory says that when people from South, Southern Indo-Europeans came and when they uh, penetrated the forests of Eastern Europe, let us say 3,000 uh, 3, years uh, before Common Era, they met with other Indo-European people, Northern Indo-European people. So there is no answer, <laughs> only guess. I have a question from uh, Dr. Abhijit Chavra. He, he does not have a mic. So he's simply asking, uh, have you published any of the research that you just presented in this talk? If yes, is there a place to find any links or something? Yeah. I almost finished a book, uh, which I, in not tuned version, was presented in India uh, at the end of last year in uh, two universities of India. So I'm just finishing the book, but you know, it's more polemic. It's more, it's not so much scientific. There are, there are sources. There, there is no fantasy here. And no, uh, no, no parascience. But there are mainly questions, not answers. Uh, for example, uh, about a question of uh, archaity of Vedic and Baltic languages. It is not a question only about archaity, not question of retaining of uh, archaic uh, concepts, words, but also about common innovations. For example, uh, it, it, it is not my invention, but you know, locative, uh, is, there are structural isoglosses between these two languages. It cannot be borrowed, you know, grammar. We have almost the same number of declensions in our language, but some of declensions, for example, instrumental and locative are only in Sanskrit and Baltic languages. They were invented. There is a common innovation. And when, when I should try to say, for example, uh, uh, with three gods, uh, I, I should say three mis device in Lithuanian. And in Sanskrit, I, sh I should say three bis device, the same. The same declension cannot be simply common origin because it was not documented in other languages. Participles, very, very rich participles in both languages and, and, and suffixes for these participles. So, sorry, I will make another, <laughs> make another election. So I wait for new questions. Also future tense, for example, future tense with suffix s or C. There was no future tense in other Indo-European languages. But the construction of future tense in, I, I stress, Indo-Aryan and Baltic language, language is the same.
only in these two languages. So this is a proof of lasting neighborship, neighborhood, which is documented by Trubachev up to fifth century of common era. So this is my main point. Do you hear me? Yes, uh, Dr. Sangaila. I think uh, the others would have got the response as well. I muted them again. Um, so I, uh, uh, Abhijit has a follow-up observation. If I could, if I could understand your lecture properly, uh, you you are not a believer of uh, the out of India theory, and you seem to suggest that there is a proto-Indian, proto-Indo-European neighborhood. Uh, which is the root of uh, all the origin, if if I understood that correctly. I am not a pro I am not a prophet, you know. Uh, <laughs> I simply presented the mainstream uh, theory, but uh, yes, of course, when we speak about the time after three thousand and five hundred years before Common Era, yes, we have. Uh, documented data about uh, migrations or in infiltrations from north to south. And out of India theory does not contradict that. They say that people from North India came to steps before that. So it's a question for investigations. Uh, mm. If you look, it's, you know, I am a physician. If you look to uh, genetic data, which comes more and more, then you see that the trend was of people coming from south to north. But the, this trend was from <laughs> 11,000 years ago. Uh, so maybe these people who came after Ice Age, they came from refuge, from steppe zones, which bordered with North India. Uh, so uh, I am I am proponent of uh, Southern uh, North Pontic region, but. I, I don't know whether it was secondary homeland or whether it was a primary home, homeland. But Indian academicians should somehow um, put themselves into the context of European science. And when we put in this context, then we see that Gimbutas theory is the most close theory to Indo-Aryan world. Dr. Songaila, we'll circulate this. Um, so any requests uh, from participants, if you want to contact, you may drop us an email. We'll just share the... Yes, okay, I, uh, it, would be, it, it, it would be interesting for me, these contacts, because uh, the... Uh, my goal is to interest Indian society to these things. It seems somehow, I don't know why, maybe because of you are also, uh, how to say, a new uh, restored country after British rule, but somehow you are isolated and uh, not interested in uh, greater India greater India, uh, which is out of India, out of present day India. That's actually uh, not true, Dr. Sangaila. It's not that we are not interested. And actually, in the last few years, uh, this whole ecosystem of asking these difficult questions about reevaluating, rewriting our history have become very pronounced, have really come out. The challenge has been uh, post-independence in 1947, uh, a very communist Marxist 
yeah. grip on the Indian academia, right? Which which basically openly has been calling for breaking India into multiple pieces, right? And so as if so any. Uh, you know there are even conversations saying that india came into existence in 1947 <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> very very strange people yes I understand you we are a small country but we have the same problems here yeah, yeah. And that of has course. been going on and there has been you know the other side which has a very civilizational rootedness of indian indianness or indian history our, our perspectives have had no voice in neither in education nor in mainstream media. Only now in the last few years, we are all getting a voice and, you know, channels like ours and, and many, many, many more uh, publications and voices are coming out, uh, you know, strongly uh, to, to come out with different narratives on rewriting our history and all the doubts uh, uh, that, that are obvious in, in the history we are told uh, in connection, especially with things like Aryan mig invasion and then migration and so on and so forth. Uh, it's very interesting, inspiring time. Uh, and I, 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 I hope uh, that the, it will be interesting time also for new scientific uh, visions and uh, investigations uh, because the main the main uh, inspiration is a big big secret uh, which still lies in our uh, history. So I have a question before I go back to Ramakrishna from IIT again, uh, who had okay. a little question, and this is a comment that you made on um, uh, you know Christianity and the. The stories that you know of of Lithuanians being uh, backward and all of that that you were talking about, right? So what? Yes. Yeah. So what? Two questions. I'm guessing. One, general Lithuanians. Um, are, are you generally a Christian nation, or do you see what does the larger population? Is there a trend towards a uh, reversal towards pre-Christianity paganism, if I may say. And in that context, what about you personally? Do you see yourself as a person from belonging to the Vedic civilization? Or how, how does this the two parts to the question really? Uh, statistically, there are 80% uh, Christians, Catholics in Lithuania. That is, of course, exaggerated statistics. You are, your question is, you are right when you ask about reversal to uh, heathen, pagan uh, traditions. Yes, there is such a reversion. Uh, after we regained our independence in 1990, uh, it was possible already to cultivate, let us say, heathen uh, traditions, which were not dead in Lithuania. It is not neo-paganism. The dif very difference from other European countries that heathen traditions survived up to 20th century and still survives in our songs. I myself, I am singing many Lithuanian songs and they had survived in um, traditions and fire worshipping traditions and so on. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I am uh, uh, um, Romuvian, I, am, I, I, I belong to Romuva community, the religious community which is uh, continuous pre-Christian traditions. And the, of course, this Romuva tradition is very uh, close to Vedic civilization. This is another question regarding the close similarities between Sanskrit and Lithuanian. So, uh, from the list that you gave us, it seems it is much closer than any other Indo-European language. So, 
my point is is it really something deep seated or is it just an accident because as you yourself noted uh, heathenism survived until the 15th century in lithuania and of course india is still uh, mostly heathen so could that be the reason for the preservation of archaic forms rather than any kind of uh, uh, deep seated connection uh, i tried to show in one slide that there are three possible explanations one about isolation of both nations from you know various accidents uh, in between various wars plagues migrations another is the, the one which you mentioned conservativeness which is linked mostly to traditional things to impact of as i said priestly classes to non written civilization yes of course uh, these things survived in our country because it was last heathen big and last country in eastern europe which was not christianized forcefully it be our dukes our we you know our king became a king of poland and decided to uh, adopt christianity but up to 17th 18th century majority of population was still uh, continuing old traditions but we should understand that also there is a common origin uh there is a we were neighbors but we were neighbors from the time of uh disintegration of so called uh in the european homeland did i answer your question this is not a, a accident of course uh, not a curiosity not a curiosity it it is a deep rooted uh, the consequence of deep rooted historical affinities neighborhood and common origin and uh, one of the puzzling things in uh, gimbutas theory the kurgan hypothesis somehow it seems to me that all the indo european languages at least the oldest indo european languages seem to lie outside the pontus as far as you know antiquity goes maybe i am wrong but uh, do you have an idea i mean if the pontic steps are the origins of indo european or proto indo european then the earliest forms should be found in that neighborhoods of uh, at least linguistic inference um as i said that the southern ukraine and southern russia of present present day uh, countries uh, territories these territories we are inhabited by so called skitians in greek tradition and these people in mainstream science are treated as iranian people but it comes out that they were also and maybe mainly in the aryan people living here from ancient time uh, and uh, uh, when in the aryan languages spread and it's of course uh, true Uh, from uh, this step area because they were nomadic equestrian um, militaristic patriarchal people when they spread into middle europe into middle danube region the secondary homeland of indo european languages was established in that region as i said in uh, beginning of last century the first half of it 
there was the most fashionable theory that all Indo-Europeans come from Central Europe. Now it is clear from genetic data, from archaeologic data, that it is a second step after, let us say, invasion or infiltration of nomadic people to this area. Nomadic people which were akin to Indo-Aryans because Indo-Aryans are the first nation which created nomadism as a cultural civilization because of horses which were tamed, you know, in 4000 before common era in this steppe region. And also because of chariots, uh, which were also found in, in arche archaeological research near Ural, the first chariots were, were found there. And usually scholars put Indo-Aryan ho Indo homeland between southern Ural, Volga, and Central Asia. So it's not so far from, from northern India. But all languages in Central Europe, which occurred in the European languages, they occurred after 3,000 years before Common Era. So all this Celtic, German, Latin or, or Italic languages, they were, how to say, later languages. On one side. On another side, they have also many archaeities. For example, phonetic archaeities, they retained cantum phonemes. For example, cantum, as I said, centum, yes. And uh, in the core area, of Indo-European languages, in, let us say, Balto-Slavic and Indo-Iranian, there was a change from K to S or SH, from G to Z to J. But there were also Cantum languages in the East, you know, Toharian languages, also Cantum languages in the South, Hittite languages. So this is a story this is a story of uh, already split in the European languages, which were around Southeastern and Central Asian territories. Uh, Dr. Songaila will be interested in connecting with you. And... Yeah, may, may, may I add one thing? Yes. This please. is a theory that uh, archaic things uh, are retained mainly in uh, peripheries. And the central region of languages usually is, uh, how to say, um, in, uh, exposed to innovations. So it's a question of time, because probably there was a time when Baltic and Indo-Aryan languages were central and they made innovations because and because of that grammar of both languages is very complicated and the system grammar system is complicated because it was new it was a common innovations and peripheric languages let us say Celtic or, or German or, or Toharic, some or Hittite. Uh, in some respects, they are more archaic. They are more primitive. They have less uh, declensions. They have no gender and so on. Even gender was an innovation of this core region of Indo-Europeans. There is no gender in German, no gender in, in Hittite. So it's a more complicated uh, picture. I don't have a question. I have a comment. So if you want to take the question first, it's okay. 
okay whatever go ahead make your comment okay so uh, since he brought up this issue of the periphery languages uh, preserving archaisms at the periphery i just wanted to point out uh, the similar phenomenon even in our indian community so uh, indian groups that have migrated from india to south africa or trinidad or fiji or other places malaysia in the last 300 years or so uh, those people seem to retain a lot of the old usages of their mother tongues relative to the situation in the mother tongue in core india itself today so when you meet people from those places and you try to talk to them in that language of course they are mutually intelligible but uh, you will find that they preserve those archaisms so this is a very uh, simple example recent example of this kind of preservation at the periphery that's it yes i agree i have a follow up comment uh, very interestingly wherever indians have traveled in the last once again largely also with uh, with the british empire they have carried names of rivers for example so if i'm not wrong it's mauritius uh, that there is uh, uh, you know basically there is was no large river or something like that they have named a very large lake which is now called the ganga for example and so these are indian communities who are going and then they are making giving local names to wherever they are they have a certain influence or at least among them so it's a very interesting phenomena that they are taking names of rivers cultural uh, memories to new places even though they have and continue to retain that and you know even in the west indian community for example there's a lot of indians Uh, very interestingly there was a video of an indian marriage which could look like a luchian's delhi or or you know very upper class delhi punjabi marriage which you know and these are people who have not seen india for three generations so just a very strong civilizational memory that's being carried i may may I comment uh, a little yes. uh, for example about this sindhu river uh, you know Uh, indian uh, name is from sindhu uh, and in in iranian hindu and that's why is your nation name but there was one sindhu in central asia it's tejen another sindhu we have in in uh, was in south ukraine so it's again we have so of course it's because of general word sindhu which means which means uh river in indo-aryan language but also maybe because of transfer of traditions uh, also you may look uh, to indo-aryan hydronyms in central asia and uh, in other territories of steppe for example uh amber river which uh, confluence with in northern caspia it means amber you know in sanskrit it's water it is not iranian word uh for example daiksh daiksha it's a ancient ural river uh, name uh you know daiksha uh, like diksha is uh how to say sacred sac in sacred for something yes and so on uh, so the, there are hydronyms of indo aryan uh, origin all over this region for example samara which is com- confluent with volga in russia samara is like frontier it's like like enemy if it will be iranian it will be hamara not samara and so on so but nobody uh investigates that there is so this is like uh how to say uh dogma that all this territory belong to iranian civilization then they make one interesting uh, methodological uh, thing when they try to explain word they look to sanskrit then they say that this word is old iranian and then they use this as a data 
to prove Iranian uh, civilization, which is later thing, of course. It, 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 later it was mixed Iranian, Indo-Aryan uh, people, but huh, you should look to Iranian words, not to Indo-Aryan, to prove something. Then they make a corpus of such words, and they say, okay, you, you look, this is old Iranian, and it, it means that these people were Iranians. When you look the origin of this word, then you see there is no documented fact that it was Iranian, only Sanskrit word. So it's very deep problem and uh, these dogmas are not so easily or uh, can be o overcome <laughs> okay sorry so i have read that in the 12th century the roman catholic church uh, declared a crusade against the pagan uh, state of lithuania especially the ruling class so um, with time there were on and off times where the ruling class switched their religion from uh, Catholicism to back to paganism. I don't uh, know how true is the source, but how is that the uh, Christian world in Europe targeted every part of the world, but somehow the Lithuanian nation was left from them? Hmm. I said that first of all, you know, uh, 250 years of war if we also uh, take, let us say, thousand uh, coasts of Baltic Sea, which were attacked by crusaders at first. So it will, it will be almost 300 years of total continuous war. Probably the, maybe the longest uh, war in human history. It is a war between Christian Europe and Baltic civilization. Uh, maybe Reconquista, you know, in, in Spain was of, of, of similar um, long, longevity, as, as to say. So, uh, the Christianizing of Lithuania was a political uh, decision to stop all these attacks. Uh, but uh, evangelization of Lithuanian uh, population started probably only in 17th century. Uh, and uh, even uh, Christian traditions in Lithuania, Catholic traditions, are mixed with traditional heathen culture. I mean, festivals, various traditions um, in these festivals, um, calendar things, many things uh, um, are not Orthodox Catholic, but uh, let us say mixture. So, Lithuania was not left from, <laughs> from Christian Europe. It was, there is a core of our history, uh, these fights and this blood, many people died, devastations, occupations, annexations. Do you see the Prussian territory was annexed and then Germanized? Uh, in North Latvian territory was occupied, annexed, but not succeeded to Germanize because it has no border with, you know, had no border with German nations. And in between there was Lithuania, Lithuanian state. And these two branches of crusader orders, I mean, Northern one and the, Southern one tried to make every effort to unite and to conquer the all 
coast of uh, uh, Baltic Sea, especially the Western Lithuania. I am myself. I am Western Lithuanian. Uh, we call Jamaica lowlanders, uh, and they did not succeed. They did not conquer the Western Lithuania, and they did not unite these Crusader states. Moreover, these Crusader states became vassals of Poland and Lithuania. You know, Poland and Lithuania became a commonwealth. Also, uh, some Latvian territories, they became vassals of Lithuania. Uh, but polonization started. The church, Catholic church, said that do not speak your language, do not sing your songs because it's pagan, heathen. And the uh, uh, Catholic Church was very effective in polonizing Lithuania. Almost all our elite in the beginning of the 20th century was polonized already or double languaged. And some of these uh, Lithuanian <laughs> aristocrats uh, betrayed Lithuania and became Polish. It was a conflict between Poland and Lithuania and even war in the beginning of 20th century because according Polish tradition, Lithuania is like a part of Poland. According European tradition, they look at all this region as Poland and a small Lithuanian country as a splinter from Russia. 